Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you all so much for coming to this event. We are so excited to have Clay and Grady here. Um, yeah, woo! Um, I'm Anna. I'm a supervisor at Books Are Magic, and I just want to give you all a few ground rules before we get started tonight. Um, first of all, we do ask that people keep their masks on at all times. Um, we thank you for cooperating with us on that. Um, Clay is going to give us a little reading, and then we are going to have audience <coughs> questions throughout, if that's okay with everybody. Um, and Grady will walk you through that a little bit more. Um, and then after the event, we will have um, Clay and Grady signing in the back, so we will start a little line, and we will have more books available for purchase if you'd like additional copies or other books by either of these two. So um, with that in mind, I'd like to introduce you to Clay McLeod Chapman and Grady Hendricks, who are here celebrating the release of Clay's newest novel, Ghost Eater. <laughs> follows Erin and her friends as they come together in the wake of a tragedy that leaves their friend group utterly rocked. With their pack leader dead, the trio look for closure in the form of a drug called Ghost. Now this book is not for the faint of heart. It confronts power, friendship, God complexes, hauntings, drugs, early adulthood, and grief, all in one super creepy book. <laughs> <laughs> this is um, Books Are Magic's uh, one of the most anticipated books of the year, and it's one of my personal favorite reads thus far. It's absolutely incredible. Um, it's disgusting and gripping at every turn, <laughs> and you'll never look at an open floor plan the same way. <laughs> um, now to introduce these two, um, Clay McLeod Chapman has written novels, comic books, and many children books, as well as um, written for film and TV. He is the author of the horror novels The Remaking and Whisper Down the Lane. Um, and Grady Hendricks is an award-winning novelist and screenwriter who lives in New York City. He is the author of Horror Store, My Best Friend's Exorcism, and The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, among many others that are all available for purchase. Um, so without any further delay, please join me in welcoming Clay and Grady. Thank you. <laughs> We're alive. We are real people. Um, this means the world to me. Um, this is the first. This is the first in-person event that I have done uh, in two years. Uh, came out with a book uh, with Cork Books in 2019. It was called The Remaking. Uh, it was October 2019. The world was a oyster. Um, and and then uh, 2020 happened. Um, but uh, Cork has been really kind and considerate to. Uh, bring me back again and again, and uh, they brought me back for another book, um, which is called Ghost Eaters. And uh, this is the first time that I'm reading from it since it's been out uh, live and in person. So I, I want to say thank you to all of you for braving uh, the, the world. Uh, I want to say thank you to Books and Magic for making this possible. I want to say thank you to Grady for joining me. Um, it's truly an honor. So uh, thank you. Uh, this is, uh, am I going to start crying? Yeah. Uh, uh, forgive me for what I'm going to read because um, I was going to read from the, the prologue because that, you know, let's hit the ground running. But um, I was doing uh, an interview uh, with uh, this podcast, Book Squad Goals. And I was challenged by one of the hosts uh, not to read this section. So <laughs> that host is here tonight, and uh, I'm going to do it. So the only thing you need to know, um, this is uh, the, the book. Uh, it's called Ghost Eaters. Uh, the protagonist is a young woman by the name of Erin. Erin and her circle of friends, which includes Amara, Tobias, uh, they have lost uh, a recent friend and kind of group leader uh, by the name of Silas. And it just so happens that uh, Silas uh, came upon a new drug uh, called Ghost. Tobias doles out another dose of Ghost for each of us. One for you, for you, and one for me. Eye contact, I say, trying to bring some levity to our drug-induced seance. Cheers, Amara mumbles, not meeting my eyes. 
We all pop the pills in our mouths and swallow without another word, chasing them down with as much water as we can stomach. The living room now feels different in the daylight, smaller. The night before, the room itself seemed to expand, the wooden beams stretching over our heads. It felt like we'd been devoured by some prehistoric plywood beast. Everything looks harsh and dusty now in the sunlight. Close your eyes, Tobias starts. And I glance at M Amara before I do, but, but she won't look at me. We wish to speak with someone we've lost, Tobias announces. His voice sounds far away, as if it's coming from the corner of the living room, even though I can still feel his knee pressed against mine. Silas, if you can hear us, we want you to know that we are here. And I strain my ears as much as I can. I want to hear something, hear him, his voice. Aaron, Tobias squeezes my hand. It's your turn. Reach out to Silas. I don't know what to do. <laughs> I mean, what am I supposed to say? If my eyes were open, I would feel like a complete idiot. But behind my eyelids, any feelings of self-consciousness begin to ebb. The presence of both Amara and Tobias slowly recedes from my mind's eye. There's no one else now. It's just me and Silas. Can you hear me? The longer my eyes are closed, the more I notice certain patterns. Diamond-shaped helixes emerge from the darkness and spiral across my eyelids. It's me! It's Aaron! The helixes twirl faster at the sound of Silas's name. They fluctuate in color, red to purple to green as they gain speed. Are you there? The temperature rises up my back before radiating through the rest of my body. The room is muggier now. The, the plastic tarps trap the warmth of the sun in the room. It feels like a sauna overheating. Silas, Tobias says, we're here. Can you hear us? Silas, I jump in. I don't want Tobias to reach him first. I know you're there. The presence of my body the very sensation of my skin begins to fade. I'm dissolving. I can't tell where my skin is anymore, where I stop and the house starts. Silas, if you can hear me, I want you to, I want you to know that I never left you. I am the house. Every room is a chamber of my heart. Every hallway, an artery, every beam, a bone. All I need now is a ghost. I'm ready to be haunted for Silas's spirit to possess this vessel. I never let you go, Silas, I say. I never meant to hurt you. The fluctuating colors behind my eyelids compresses themselves, taking shape, a silhouette. I wish I could take back everything I said that night. I, I wish I could go back and the floor creaks behind me. A footstep. It's such an abrupt sound that I, I, I can't help but open my eyes. And I'm immediately met by harsh sunlight. The sun has shifted, seemingly in a matter of minutes. Or have we been sitting here for hours? I don't know. Long enough for the sun to move along its path, the light sliding across the living room. I love you, Silas. I miss you. I... And a pocket of shadow remains in the far corner. The sun can't reach that far into the room. There's something palpable within the darkness, something growing, gaining potency. Then the shadow starts to move. Something, someone, is standing in the corner. Do you see that? I hear myself ask, but it doesn't sound like the words are coming from me. Tobias glances around the room. See, see what? I don't see anything. In the corner, right there. Amara won't look behind her. She refuses to see. Her focus remains on the floor, the walls, the ceiling, anything but that far corner of the living room, anywhere but there. The silhouette steps forward, out, from the shadows, the darkness follows as if somehow it drags the shadows with it, tugging at that black, a web spindling out from the wall. I see him. I see him. Silas? Where? 
Tobias asks. Where is he? He's unable to hide his anxiety. His head whips around the room, desperate to see. And when he finally does see him, the stillness that takes over his face is so sudden, it's as if someone pressed pause on his body. Only his eyes move, frenzied. He whispers, it's him. Silas, I... Mm. My throat is too dry. I need water, but I can't look away from him. I can't bring myself to break contact. He might disappear again. Silas, it's me. It's Aaron. Saying his name gives him life. Saying his name out loud seems to give him life. I'm giving him life as if it's enough to endow him uh, with existence once more. Can you, can you hear me, Silas? Can you see me? A name is a vessel. It holds certain syllables, certain cadences. If you say them in a certain order, in a certain rhythm, you are able to invoke the very breath of God. And I want to say Silas' name with life again. I want to say his name out loud and have it sound the way I used to say it when he was alive. I want to say his name with all of my heart to endow every letter with love, everlasting love. Silas! I cough. There's something caught in my throat, but I, I, I can't look away from him. Silas, it's me. I'm here, Silas. I... Something thick starts to move up my esophagus. I I, I can hear myself retch. It's wet, labored, Aaron. Amara's hand tightens its grip around mine, squeezing my fingers. Whatever is rising up my throat now blocks the airway. I can't breathe. Amara yanks on my arm. I pray that the pleading look in my eyes broadcasts the absolute inability to inhale. I can't breathe. And my chest heaves once, twice. I can't breathe. The bulge in my throat works its way up. I can't. Silas is gone. If he'd ever been there before. I mean, he was, though, wasn't he? Hadn't I seen him? What's wrong? Tobias asks, kneeling before me. What is, and I retch once more, my entire body starts to seize. Aaron, a tendril of white, wet substance pushes past my lips and it coils and oscillates in front of my tear-stained face, branching out and upwards, a root reaching for sunlight. Holy shit! (laughs) Tobias pushes away from me, his eyes fixated on the tendril, but my jaw locks, unable to close, as I continue to expel the substance from deep within me. It just keeps coming and coming, whatever it is, unspooling, blooming in the air above our heads. I can't breathe, can't breathe, can't... Amara reaches out to touch it. Don't! Tobias starts. The tip of her index finger barely grazes the surface of that writhing mass, wet and alive. Tobias tries to pull Amara's hand away. Don't touch it! But the mass ruptures. Whatever suspended itself in the air immediately loses its hold the moment Amara touches its slippery surface. It falls to the floor and bursts into a yellowish liquid that appears to contain the contents of my last meal. Trail mix and bile splash across the floorboards. I feel as if I have just broke through the surface of a body of water, finally able to breathe again. I gasp for air, drawing in deep, ragged breaths as I expel the last of the drug out from my stomach. Aaron, Aaron! And I finally look at Amara. The terror in her expression is unmistakable. What? I say hacking uncontrollably. I hold out my arms to her. I need to hold someone, need to feel safe. What? It's okay, it's okay, I got you. 
Amara opens her arms and I collapse into her, letting her take my trembling body and keep me from shaking. I can't stop. She combs the wet hair out of my face with her fingers, using her sleeve to wipe the vomit from my cheeks. What was that? I shriek. Tobias is practically hyperventilating. The elation on his face sends a chill through me because I know exactly what that expression means. It works. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. is based on a fungus, on a mushroom. Uh, and funguses are weird. Um, <laughs> they're their own kingdom. They're not animal. They're not plants. Uh, when we say animal, vegetable, mineral, we should also say fungus. So what creepy, weird crap did you come up with while you were researching funguses? <laughs> I mean, Shock us. You know, it's, it's funny because it, when I, the, the genesis for the, the story came about, uh, I was tapped to like uh, like make a feature film about a, it was like the pitch was like, oh, let's do a haunted drug, haunted drug. And at that point, it was like a designer drug, like a model, like something that was like made in a lab. Um, that feature never went anywhere. But the story, like honestly, just those two words just wouldn't leave me. Like I just like obsessed over the idea of like a haunted drug. And the more I thought about it, and then, like years later, it was just this idea of like, well, what, like, what kind of drug? I wanted to create something natural. Like, I wanted and and like, you know, doing kind of research on. I read this amazing book called uh, "The Day of Saint Anthony's Fire," which was uh, Argo poisoning. The the oh yeah yeah, yeah sure um you know France grain moldy grain turned like an entire village into this this kind of like nightmare like everybody started to kind of like hallucinate and it was just astounding to think of like all because of this this little this kind of contaminated batch of of grain like it just affected this entire town yeah um and you know one thing led to another and it was like i want to get away from designer drugs like i wanted something i wanted something organic i wanted something natural and you know just thinking of mushrooms and how like, you know, once, you know, we return to this earth and, you know, become, you know, become one with it once more. Like, yeah, it was like mushrooms are the perfect thing. And then I read Mexican Gothic and it was like, oh, Jesus, this is like, I, it was terrifying. And it's like, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? So I, I figured like, you know, making it the drug that like, if it's in a little cap, if it's in a little, you know, they grind it down, they go through this whole amazing process of like, you know, they have all their coffee grinders set up and their little gel caps and like, it becomes a whole little breaking bad. <laughs> yeah. No, and funguses are bizarre, right? I mean, they're named witch's butter, uh, devil fingers, bleeding teeth mushrooms, like, they were, so what's, did you figure out the whole life cycle of your mushroom? Yes. I, you know, so, I, I'm afraid that if I come close, I'm gonna... You can come close. Yeah. Don't be afraid. Is I going to start reverbing? Um, the the idea was like only our heart. <laughs> the the notion of the life cycle was that, and I the, it, it hues on spoiler territory, so I want to yeah. be careful. Okay. But but the idea of like a self fulfilling cycle of drug and user kind of merging. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think you know, there's that beautiful scene in Hannibal. Where have you did you have you seen Hannibal? With bits, bits. Um, do you know the episode I'm talking about? It's an amazing episode. Uh, season one. I'm not gonna be able to call out the episode number, but uh, the, like this idea of like kind of uh, creating a cycle where the I don't know, like the the narcotic and the user just it's like it becomes its own process. And uh, the, no, I'm not gonna go there. I'm not gonna go there. But uh, um, there are there is a particular mushroom that only grows off of uh, dead things, that it, it, it needs uh, f 
essentially it needs bodies, it needs flesh to uh, proliferate, to, to grow. Um, and we kind of took a little bit of that and this idea of something that, that could potentially be a little bit more cannibalistic and uh, kind of took, like merged them together and created a, a, a term that doesn't exist, which is like sarco -philium. Like it was, it's basically, it good. yeah, like it, it, it's, it's an absolute abstract, not real, but it's like, oh, we, we, we merged two things that we really liked into one wonder drug. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, folks, we're not gonna do a QA and a at the end. Just raise your hands if you have a question. We can take them. We can take them on the fly. Uh, we're professionals. Uh, so, but yeah, and you know, and one of the things about like listening to this reading and, and when you're talking about the drugs, like, you know, psychedelics are hip right now, right? Michael Pollan's taking them, everyone's doing them. Um, but writing about drugs can be really boring because it can sometimes feel like listening to someone describe their dreams. So did you have ground rules for like what to do, what not to do? I mean, ground rules in the sense of like it had to be scared. I mean, I, I think like, you know, like, I, yeah, no one has a good trip in your book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's there are moments of happiness initially. Like there's like there's like there's like there's like, there's like moments of like reaching out and touching someone. The, the drug is like if you know you pop this pill and you're able to see the dead. So what happens if there's someone that you've lost that you really want to reconnect with? And that that idea of like you take ghost and it it permits you a chance to kind of have uh, in kind of standard Fox Sisters way like that that seance that that kind of lures lures in the, the people that you wish to come speak to. Um, and, uh, you know, this isn't a spoiler, but it goes bad. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know the, the, the floodgates start to open and, you know, there's, there's the people you want to see versus everybody else out there who's uh, just, you know, you know, how many people have passed away in this building? You know, like there's, like, you know, the, the history that's kind of embedded into the ground yeah. itself. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, and also, you know, it's funny because um, in books and movies, oftentimes grief and addiction come across the same. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's someone overwhelmed by something that causes them to physically decline and to become emotionally unstable and irrational around other people and to crave something really badly. So were you like that clued into combining those two things early or were you like, oh shit, I'm onto something as you were doing it? I mean, it, I feel very fortunate because the, the editorial process was really helpful. The, the first uh, draft that I turned in was such a dirge. I mean, it was, it was the, the grief was, sure. it was just nothing but like opaque. Uh, it, it, it was just unrelent. You know, I, I do have these words kind of seared into my head and I, apologies to my editors, but like unrelentingly, unrelentingly grim, <laughs> <laughs> opaque, and plotless. I mean, and and but they were right. I, <laughs> I mean, it was it was like, you know, because I was reading like, you know, Hubert Selby Jr. Don't and like wrong. Burroughs and like you know like like wanting like like going like like Rush. Do you guys remember Rush? Like like yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's like like the the, the books that were just like. Raw, like right. raw addiction. And but Burroughs is fun. I mean, I, Hubert Selby Jr. not so much. Yeah. Burroughs can be fun. It's, it's, you aren't reading the fun stuff. No, I mean, well, I read, I read Junkie. Uh, I, not fun ones. Yeah, I, I did reread, re uh, uh, of course, you know, Naked Lunch and Nova Express. But it, I mean, that, that was just kind of more kind of like going right. on the journey. Yeah, but like. Um, even stuff like Bright Lights, Big City, like, uh, or Less Than Zero, like, like, trying to think in terms of, like, what, like, how addiction, like, uh, you know, ripples through a, a group, like, a circle of friends, and, like, you know, particularly a group in their young, young to mid-20s. Yeah, um, yeah. That seemed like a fun kind of mm -hmm. button to push. Just a sidebar for a second, how, do, how does Bright Lights, Big City, and Less Than Zero hold up these days? <laughs> I mean, I... I think Bright Lights probably holds up a little bit more than, than mm. Less Than Zero. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. I would have to move apart. I don't think Buddy Stanellis is here. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, he definitely yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because there is something very grindingly cocaine-y about those books. It can feel like being trapped with yeah. someone, you know, who just won't shut up. Like written in that yeah. style and, yeah, like, yeah. you know. So you know, I, I think like that first draft was just like get the um, get the grief out. For, yeah. Like grief was the, the kind of driving force, 
And then, and then the, the kind of challenge was positive, like, okay, well, where's the story? Like, what's the, like, you know, are we gonna just watch these, this group of friends, like, just succumb to their addiction? And uh, the, the, you know, I think the bones came kind of a, at an, another point because it was m more about, like, how do we take this emotion and give it the scaffolding that's gonna mm -hmm. put, propel the story forward? Yeah, it's also talking about the friends. Like, the friendships in this are very, what are they, in their early 20s? Yeah, very early 20s friendships where you're still friends with people who are, yeah. like, super toxic. Like, you haven't figured out how to get rid of them from the friend circle yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's crass, and none of these people are here now, but... Um, 30 minutes ago. Well, I, uh, I mean, I, we were talking about this before. Like, I went to a small liberal arts college where, you know, every every year there was like a, a group of like fiction student, fiction, you know, first year fiction students that'd be like, you're you're Oster, I'm Delillo, you're you know, like, you know, and like we were we were fanficking. Yeah. And it was like we we did think we were gonna like take like we were gonna graduate from like oh, we're gonna take over the world. And like the literary establishment is not gonna be ready for us. And, uh, and then we graduated and, and we read Secret History. And all of a sudden we were like, oh, oh shit, this, this experience is not my own. Like this is, like, this is everywhere. And I'm not the, the literary snowflake I thought I was. And yeah. that, that moment, I feel like that emotional moment for someone in their 20s who like is encouraged, and is embraced academically academically like it, it feels like this is like this is the world I'm gonna like take over and then they get smacked and it's like th that's a very sobering moment and I wanted that moment to be that's where this book is happening that's where yeah. you know and with secret history like that's when you stop going out with your friends to the country yeah because you're like the human sacrifice oh my god we, there, there are moments where I'm just reading that book and I'm like I that is my not the murder part, but the like, the like, this is, like, that could be, yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny, okay, quick summer. So I went to Bennington, where Secret History Chase, for like a year, for a year, it was too crazy. Um, I went to NYU after that, because that was so normal. Um, but uh, a friend of mine died there, and it was after I had left, and so it was after, right before Secret History came out. So I went back, did the funeral, did all that stuff, and uh, died on campus. And um, then Secret History comes out, like, you know, a couple of months later, I'm reading it, and everything in that book when the student that's 100% true oh the letter God. that the psych services people the speech they give almost word for word the same speech oh the God. same student meeting in the same hall like everything was so i like threw the book across the room. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was eerie but those little small communities like those little small spring groups like you know them so well they're so predictable yeah. you know like you know what sound they make when you hit them yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but when you acknowledge, like when you recognize that you are one of those, like you, you, you entered into the assembly line, you got yeah. spat out, and like now you're in the real world, and it's that moment of like, you know, then you cry a lot. Yeah, <laughs> and then you, you, you start taking psychedelics. Yeah, exactly. That's what got me through it. Um, and also, just to remind you, if anyone has a question, throw your hand up. We'll, yes, in the back. I have a question. Hi. Uh, so this book takes place. In Virginia, which is a very specific kind of haunted place to inhabit in the U.S., and I think just like not as where Erin comes from, money. So, how did you kind of navigate the different social dynamics that were coming into this friendship, and then also being like a bunch of white friends in this place in Virginia where like slavery happened and all of these like past echoing? How did that contribute to the dynamic with the drug and with like the haunting? I mean, it's it's really it was interesting because like that first draft was a very kind of singular uh, experience of like this is this is focused on one person wanting to connect to one ghost, and in the process of revising it, a larger conversation started to happen editorially, where it was like you can't just like like the notion of reaching out and touching someone the notion of like i want like i've lost someone dear to me i want to connect to them it's like it, there's like a vibe of privilege to it it was really interesting to kind of like discuss and crack open and so the 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 conversation kind of furthered itself to the extent where we're like well what like let's really talk about what this drug would do and like the ramifications of doing it in the south the book always took place in the south 
I'm from Virginia. It, 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 was a, it was a pertinent place to kind of focus on because Richmond and Virginia and the South kind of holds, holds its history on its back and you know, you're, you're walking over graves no matter where you are. And like, his, history is there, but it's this weird cognitive dissonance about how to acknowledge that history. And like, no two people, like the conversation is always kind of, it, there's a frictive quality to it. And if this drug was gonna be something that kind of opened the floodgates to the other side, it, it seemed valuable to kind of really use it as a means to address uh, that sense, that, that idea of privilege. And Erin, the, 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 the narrator, like she's, she's a character that I kind of personally identify with as someone who kind of like grew up in the suburbs. Like I, I amped up the kind of qualities of her to like there, there are these palatial McMansion neighborhoods that are just so kind of utterly like you, you, you drive through them and it just seems so bizarre. And like there's no acknowledgement of what they're built on, like the names of these communities, like Midlothian and Monacan and like, you know, it's just like like the Huguenot, like they're like it's it's astounding and you know, nobody knows why they're called that or what, what those names represent. And uh, yeah, the drug just became like let's it became this this kind of a microscope or this this lens in which to kind of aim and and have Aaron's privilege her her kind of ability to say I want to do this kind of come back and and uh, shoot her in the foot but also though so I mean privilege yes but isn't grief like the great leveler like I mean people may express, express their grief in terms but don't we all grieve I mean isn't that one of the few things that ties everyone together I mean, yes. I, I, I feel like it's it's always interesting to me, like when someone goes through their own kind of internal, like like we have our grief moments, and if if someone I've lost, if, if I say I I lost my friend or I lost a, a, a loved one or a family member, there's the kind of thoughts and prayers moment, and we we admittedly connect and like, oh my god, I'm so sorry, um, but like I I think it's more the the the, the griever. Who has to kind of like acknowledge this moment of like, I don't know, and this is very this this is personal to me, but like I know the times when I've been grieving, my reaction is like you don't understand my grief, you don't under like like I I it's very selfish and very uh, closed off, but I get I get very defensive about my grief. Um, that where, sounds normal. Yeah, because <laughs> I mean, no one can understand, right? No one can understand your relationship with that person specifically. Yeah, they can understand that you're grieving, but they can't understand exactly what that was between you and the person you've lost. So in that, like the, the kind of isolating feelings of grief, like you know, I'm gonna parallel this to a wonderful horror movie that I personally loved called Pulse. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, where it's like the 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 kind of process of feeling isolated and further isolated and kind of like you can your circle of friends the people around you like it doesn't matter how much you love them or connect with them like you're you're kind of closing in and it's like you're just being siloed and i i feel like that's what addiction does like it silos you so if if grief leads to addiction addiction is the thing that ultimately I don't know, like it, it closes you off. Sure. Yeah. I know, and I get it. I mean, people can be addicted to grief and grieving and more. I guess for me, you know, one of the things with this book, and, um, and maybe this speaks poorly of me as a human being, but I kept looking at these kids and being like, oh my God, what they're doing is kind of amazing. Like, they're like <laughs> necronauts. They're like going <laughs> into death. And, and, and I was like, if someone could just organize them better. Like if they, could just, if they just were on Slack and they had some spreadsheets and this wasn't quite a mess and like Tobias could chill and like I was like this could really go well like I was I had hope totally I mean I, I mean I, I feel like this is the the beta testing it's like the you know the idea is like if there was a sequel that would be when this drug has kind of taken over, like, you know, like everybody's doing it. But this is that like weird, like if the roller coaster is going up, 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 and there's that moment, like it, this is, the, this book is the, like that, like just the, the tipping into that. Yeah. But it, 
it had to be messy and it had to be kind of unorganized, but they have this like, they do have a plan, like they yeah. want a franchise, like this, like, this, this drug could be, like we're on to something, guys. And, you know, I, I would love, you know, if there were five more chapters, 10 more chapters, like it would have been like, and then they're selling it. And then, I mean, they do, I mean, they do start selling it. Like it's like they, they implement this awful plan that doesn't work very well. <laughs> but at that point, the drug is getting what it wants and it's, it's happy. Um, yeah. It's just that the, the people doing it are just in that Breaking Bad way. Like they're more Jesse than uh, Mr. Bad. Why am I? <laughs> Mr. Mr. White? Mr. White. What's his name? Walter. 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 Yeah, yeah. They're more Jesse than Walter. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's fake. They add cinnamon. <laughs> There's even a line, like, it's so stupid, but, like, I added a line where it was like, like, the, Tobias is like, I even add cinnamon for, like, little kick, because that's, like, what, what <laughs> Jesse does. <laughs> like, like, I want to add a little. What is it? Cayenne pepper, sure. right? Like, 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 yeah. But I think that's such a good thing. You know, you want it to taste good. You're, it's like, it's like, you know, you want it to be fun. Yeah. I mean, they're like, this this mushroom steak tastes awful. Like, they're like, oh my god, like, my, my mouth tastes like loam. And they're like, add some, add a little cinnamon. Yeah. Uh, it solves a lot of problems. <laughs> well, and you know, and, and I guess one reason I was rooting for them is grief sucks, right? I mean, some someone, uh, my family knows who lost their kids said, you know, um, the worst thing about losing your kid is that um, it feels like the end of the world, and it's not. There's a tomorrow, and the sun keeps coming up, and you keep going. Because when you lose someone, you want that to be the end. The end, full stop, how can this continue? So yeah, I was really rooting for these guys. Like, they're disruptive, they're chaos agents, they're not very healthy, <laughs> but like, I was rooting for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want a sequel where they sort of like work out the kinks. <laughs> buy buy your books. <laughs> well, um, get word out. We'll yeah. do a sequel. I mean, we do it in a heartbeat. Yeah, I mean, look at pot, right? Like, pot used to be a terrible, terrible thing. Supposedly, you know, it was going to make people switchblade each other. And now, like, you can get CBD oil anywhere. Like, I'm putting a bug in your ear. <laughs> but, so, uh, one of the things I want to talk about is, first off, you kind of talked about the South thing. Because uh, this book does have a very dankness that's very sweaty armpit south. Like, I don't think I would have felt the same about it if it didn't feel quite so humid and, and Richmondy. Yeah. Um, but also, it's to some extent a haunted house book. Um, but your haunted house is in a zombie subdivision. So I, I don't. Did you? Were you looking at pictures of zombie subdivisions and all that? Or? Oh God, yes. Do zombie subdivisions. Zombie subdivisions. The, the kind of abandoned uh, subdivisions, like they're like half built, and then the you know financial market tanks and they're just abandoned um it, you know i it just seemed like when when the idea of like okay let's write a, a haunted house uh story uh read you know just kind of imbibed all of the house of leaves all of the horror stores all of the like i mean you name it like what were the what are the the narratives that that kind of pushed the envelope enough of like what what is the concept behind a haunted house. Like, I love the idea of, like, let's, like, what is a haunted house? Like, I, I just got obsessed with, like, all of the kind of, like, not tropes, but the kind of, like, like, a, a ghost. What's a ghost? It's a sheet with two eyes in it. And, like, that's, like, I just, like, obsessed with, like, sheets and, like, you're like, what is the spin on it? And uh, so it's like, oh, clear plastic tarps. Or, like, what's the, what's the, tr what, what's the spin on a haunted house? Like, oh, this is, this isn't a haunted house that has been around for you know, centuries, or like, you know, it's not the, you know, it's not the butler mansion that's been, you know, like, yeah. it's it's something new and, and unfinished and abandoned. Like, it just, all of that stuff was, I wanted to make it something that didn't feel familiar, but but still had the bones of a haunted house. And it's like, what, what ghosts can we put in this space? And like, what, how do we make this a haunted house? So... Yeah. Okay, wait, so what did you boil down a haunted house to? You said you kept trying to get, what's the, what's the, what's the root? <laughs> I mean, well, for me, in the book, it was this notion of vessels. Like, you know, ghosts just want to feel contained. Like, you know, a ghost doesn't have definition until you put that sheet on it. Like, if it doesn't have a sheet, it's just like, you know, like, how many ghosts are here right now? We just don't know because they're not wearing <laughs> sheets. So, like, it's just like that. Like, like, I want, like, a house to me was just the, like, the, 
the parameter, the confinement of a spirit. Like it, it just wants to like kill animals. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah. They, just, they just want to be cozy somewhere. Like they want to belong someplace. They want a roof over their head. And like that kind of that sense of domesticity. Like 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 I th- I feel like on the other side, yes. Like when we speak about haunted houses, it's like the idea of like this is like a certain trauma happened here. That like an event happened here, a murder, a death, a suicide. Like like that's what roots the spirit to it. But I wanted to be like, well, what if, you know, you know, we have haunted dolls, we have haunted cars, we have haunted shoes, like we have, <laughs> so it's like, can people be haunted? Like what, what, are, what are the, like, I just wanted to make the idea of a vessel and focus on the idea of a container and a house is a container, but people are containers, you know, like I, gel caps are containers. And like, I just like focusing on the idea of what, what is the confinement or the, the, the scaffolding around? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, and if ghosts haunt spaces, like, you know, there's gonna be some very disappointing spaces full of ghosts in the future, so we keep building terrible buildings, <laughs> like, like mansions and Chase ATM branches and Wayne Reeds, a lot of haunted Wayne Reeds in the future. Yeah, which, which I mean, I think it's back to your question where it's like, what, you know, if, you know, for, for someone to grow up in, Midlothian, Virginia, which was just one of these neighborhood, like it was a neighborhood that just like had like how like the houses themselves were just so big and 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 relatively bland. Um, and I just thought of like, well, who are the people who are here a hundred years, two hundred years before before this house, and like what would how would they kind of interact and engage with with the, these spaces and the people who live in there? Um, and you know, for so often, the idea is that we can kind of turn a blind eye to the things that we don't want to see. We can kind of not look at the, the people or the things that we don't care to, to see. Um, just move along. But ghost is the it's the it's the leveler. You know, now you see everybody and they see you and they're not so happy about it. And like it's just like you know they they are con- like you now have to confront your ghosts. You have to confront your past. You have to confront your history. And that's that was. Uh, an exciting kind of thread to explore. Checking in for questions. Anyone? Yes, Kelly. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, I have a question about ghosts, uh, especially the ghosts in this book. I'm just wondering, like, did you think about whether you wanted the ghosts to know how scary they were? <laughs> like, do ghosts know that they're being scary, or are they just trying to like do their thing and they're just terrifying because they're ghosts? I, I mean, if I it, it, definitely more the latter. I don't think that they are aware of uh, how scary they are to Aaron. Right. Um, I think Aaron is having a really bad day. <laughs> <laughs> and the, you know, so much of it is just filtered through her reaction. Like, honestly, like, there's this notion of if you just stop to look, that, like, whatever, whatever kind of shock to the system of, like, oh my god, you died in a fire, you look terrifying, but also the, the kind of, the, the, the tragedy that's imbued in that is, it's, I, I was hoping, and, and maybe this is me, you know, needing the reader to meet me halfway, but like, the, the things that make these ghosts in this book so specifically grotesque or terrifying is, are the traumas that they themselves experienced in, in life, and to acknowledge what those are, you know the the scars the the you know the the burns that the, they have a historical root that if you're to say to yourself you know you you're here and this is the the uh, you know the the great richmond theater fire of 1811 and you know like you know the burning of the you know uh, richmond burned so many times like it's amazing how like they just set that town on fire like time and time again and it's like and I mean I don't know yeah so I, I don't think they are aware of it I think they're just really it, it, not to sound clear but I really think they're happy that someone is noticing them that they're all of a sudden like you see me like so much of it has been that I see you but you're not acknowledging me but now you see me and that's new and I want to know what this means and uh it just so happens that the person who is doing it is tripping their balls off and like, <laughs> pan- like the, the, the panic of like, oh my, you know. So it's just a miscommunication. <laughs> 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 
Have you ever seen a ghost? No. I have imagined I've seen ghosts. But in the moment, you felt like you were seeing a ghost. I, I mean, I, I've been in a room, and the lights are off, and then something moves, and I just stop, and I look, and I wait for it to move again, and it doesn't. But then I'm like, like I imbue the moment with so much yeah. that like it's like there was something there. Wasn't there something there? There's nothing there. I don't, I don't believe, but I kind of want to believe. Got it. And that's the I'm, I'm an agnostic on ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> quick, quick room poll. Who's who here seen a ghost or something they thought was ghost like? Yeah. Yeah. One. Uh, 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 keep your hand up. Don't be shy. I'm just trying to get an idea of how many. One, two, three, four, like five, six. Really? That seems low. Okay. Uh, I, think, I think everyone else is just shy. Um, yeah. No. But I think it's a pretty human thing to see a ghost or to see something you feel like is a ghost. Like you know. Um, and it's weird because I've always thought like you know you see a ghost you're gonna wanna. I don't know, for me personally, like, approach it, right? Like, why not? Um, and then it's usually scary when it happens for some unknown reason. So then they never really do anything. Do you have a ghost tour? No, not a good one. Uh, <laughs> when I was a kid, I thought I saw a ghost, and it freaked me out. And the next day, I was like, oh, yeah, this was this street light doing all this. But in the moment, I experienced it as a ghost. And it was really, uh, it was a little banal. It was just standing there. And it was um, boring, but it was also kind of earth-shattering. Because... <laughs> There wasn't supposed to be something there, and there was, and it was scary and weird and, and horrible. And now I'm like, oh man, if that ever happens again, I want to really stop and take my time and really <laughs> savor the moment. I know I want, I'll just pee my pants again. You know? <laughs> to my defense, I was nine years old, so pee my pants happen more. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, but you know, you think you will, but they're scared. They can't help it. They can't help it. They just are. Uh, another question? Anyone? Do we Uh, I have a question. Do the uh, ghosts, if they had the choice, and if they knew they were so terrifying, would they actually want to look terrifying? Or would they just, like, be good ghosts? <laughs> I mean, I would think that they would, I, you know, sometimes in life you get dealt a card that you don't want to be dealt. Yeah. And it kind of stinks because it's like, well, that's, that's your life now, or your afterlife now, so <laughs> sorry. And, it, it, and, you know, I think a lot of the ghosts that pop up in this book are, they're, they're ghosts that have kind of been given an unfair shake. And so it's, you know, it's the kind of, I think they're a bit unhappy, um, but there's this moment where, like, now that someone can see them, you know, I. It's almost like, can you imagine like growing up in a world without mirrors and you're not aware of how you look? And it's not until somebody kind of looks at you for the first time that it's like, oh, that, why are you reacting that way to me? What, what is it, like, do I have something on my face? Um, so I, I think it's, I don't think that they would either think about changing the way they look or try to change the way they look, but it's more the kind of surprise of like, why are you looking at me that way? Um, yeah. But you're encountering one of the big problems with horror, right? That if you're writing a horror novel, you want to make what people are scared of the horror element real. But if you make it too real, it starts getting mundane. And then it gets goofy. And then you just got friendly ghosts standing around. You know what I mean? You mean like, do I have something between my teeth? Like, well, what's up? Um, so you, yeah, it's weird. Defining that line is hard. Yeah. Or maybe you didn't find it hard. Well, I don't know if I found the line. Um, I, the last draft, God bless my editors. They, the last note, big note that I got was this 50 pages, this, this last section. Like there's a section that like, there's like, most of the book takes place in this house, this unfinished house, and that becomes their kind of, their drug den. Um, but Erin kind of goes out and like has her first day on her first day at a new job. Um, and like, there's like a, like kind of a walkabout section in Richmond. Um, where she just goes from place to place to place, and all the things that could go wrong, go wrong. And my editors came back to me and they were like, this, this 50 pages should be scary. Like, let's make, let's, let's make this as scary as it can be. And like, it's so strange because like, I've never gotten a note like that before, where it's just like, you're like, well, what do you, what do you want me to, they're like, no, just make it scary. Just make, like, like just like, shift it into a higher degree. Just make it really scary. And I was like, okay. And it was like, 
it was this fun kind of exercise. Like, like the leash was kind of off, and it was just like, oh, okay, throw this there, and this there, and this. Like, it was like, like for 50 pages, pages, things just get a little batshit. And like, it's, it's kind of, ex it was exciting to me to write. I don't know how it will be to read. Um, <laughs> but it is, it is like, every, I mean, there are just so many ghosts. There's so many ghosts in Richmond, and there's so many ghosts in that 50 pages. And like, they're in that thing, that thing, like, they're in, like, it's, it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's amazing when you start thinking about vessels and containers, like newspaper kiosks, ATMs, uh, you know, like, 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 I, like, I just, it was like, let's just pump every space with a ghost. And, and then they're like, you went too far. And they, they, they like, in line edits, we cut it. So, but it was all balance. It was all balance. Uh, editors have a great uh, make it scary. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're gonna wrap up in just a minute. But one thing I did feel like needed to be said, and we talked about this before, is this bookstore is owned by Emma Straub, whose father's Peter Straub, the horror novelist who passed away last week. Um, and I just want to say something, and sorry to take time away from your book, but. Uh, Peter was huge in the 70s and especially in the 80s and now people remember Anne Rice they remember Stephen King and and his name sort of fallen out of that conversation a little bit um, and I don't know were you with Peter Straub Ken, back in the day I, I mean Ghost Story and Julia were uh, those are the two books that that were like yeah, fundamental text. See, my problem was people kept telling me to read Ghost Story, and I really didn't like Ghost Story at all, and I try it and hate it and try it again. It's like Peter Strauss, and I finally read, thought for myself, and I read Coco uh, just a few years ago, and it blew my mind. And then I read Shadowlands, which is, if no one's read Shadowlands, it is basically, if Harry Potter had been written for adults, <laughs> asking the serious questions, like why would a bunch of grown-ups put small boys in a school in the middle of nowhere and teach them magic? That seems unsavory. Like, Shadowlands is pretty heartbreaking and pretty great. So um, I guess this is our Peter Strauss PSA to say, uh, if you haven't read them, you should. And if you try Ghost Story, you may love it. If it's not your thing, Coco, Shadowlands. There's a whole bunch of other books by him. Keep going. And there's a whole section right up front yeah. of nothing but yeah. Peter. So. And he, he really is worth rediscovering or discovering for the first time. All right, dude. I, I have a question. Oh, yes. So, uh, two-part question. Uh, <laughs> those, of, those of us from Richmond, will we recognize the places? Did you mask them? And... Did you, did you have any revenge fun with the places that you chose? Um, no, there was no revenge. Um, there was, but there are, I'm gonna get the, the geography completely wrong and only someone from Richmond would acknowledge, like would recognize it and they will definitely take me to task for it. Like I am terrified of what Richmonders are gonna think of the book because they're gonna be like, that is not that street corner. Um, because Richmonders are very, they're very kind of possessive of their, that, their time. And that, I mean, I, I, my default is just to, any time I get to write something, like I just want to go back there. Um, but this was the first time where I was like, this location, and uh, yeah, they're gonna, are you from Richmond? Uh, yes. yes, basically. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, CMC at gmail, give them a note. All right. Thank you, guys. And one last question. Anyone? Nope, nope. Okay, that's it. Um, I want to say thanks again. Oh, yeah, this of is amazing. No, I it love is the book. So. such an honor. Um, and thanks to Books Are Magic. Thank you, Cork. Thank you, you, for me. Thank you out there. Like, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, have a lovely, lovely night. signing and personalizing in a line at this back desk. Um, we're just going to give them a few minutes to set up and then people can start heading back. We have additional books available for purchase up front. Um, and then we also, if you're joining us on live stream, you can order them online. And um, yeah, we just want to say thank you guys so much for coming out. This has been incredible. Um, just give us a few minutes and then you can have more questions and comments for these two. Let's give it up one more time. <laughs>